Welcome to Vote Pro Podcast, brought to you by VotePropot.com. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Vote Pro Podcast. I'm Phil Adams. I'm Jay Britton. And I'm Andrew McCready's. The California Senate has okayed special banks for marijuana retailers. We're going to talk about that. A bizarre twist of, of circumstance. It turns out Mexicans are now smuggling California weed into Mexico. Andrew's got that story. So we're going to talk about some ex-lawmakers uh, from the Democratic side joining a cannabis advisory board. The NFL is going to study marijuana as a, quote, alternative therapy for pain. Um, but first, and we're going to get to a, a lot of other things, but first, um, we had a, um, a message on our um, voicemail that is very indicative of a lot of the questions we get on a fairly regular basis. Hi, Vote Pro pod- Podcast. I would like to ask a question based on um, something that I've been thinking about as someone who is pro-cannabis. I uh, work in the industry in Maryland, and I was wondering what is the most effective way that everyday citizens can become active in the um, pro-pot agenda for the upcoming election? Um I think that it would be really nice to know easy things or potentially um, certain types of uh, congressional members that can be sent different emails or things like that. And I'd love to just know more about that. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate all that y'all do um, for the cannabis movement. Well, Claire, as, uh, as you know, really nothing changes without the involvement and uh, and participation of individuals like you. You know, we often think of advocacy as being something that politicians do, that lobbyists do, people in suits in Washington do. But the fact is, it's really the job of we, the people. So um, what can you do? Well, we have a lot of suggestions. Um, first of all, first and foremost, register to vote. Everything you need to know about registering a vote, you can find in the U.S. Vote Foundation or Rock the Vote. We've got links to that on our website. Then kind of get the lay of the land. Know what your state laws are. Um, Know who in your among your local officials are, who they are and where they stand. Another thing you can do is find out when they're having committee hearings. Now, these are open to the public and for a very good reason. You can go, you can listen to what's going on, you can participate. These are all, It's each one is a public forum. And, you know, this is where decisions are made. This is when it's time to get involved. And uh, you can maintain uh, your anonymity um, if you like. Um, and one place to start with information on these public hearings is... Uh, at the Marijuana Policy Project, and we have a link to that on our site as well. Another good one is the Maryland Cannabis Policy Coalition. There's other Maryland-based groups. There's a Maryland, there's actually sort of, if you go to to the Marijuana Policy Project and click on Maryland, that'll give you a lot of information. Now, also, you can go to the Maryland uh, Medical Cannabis Commission's website and get a lot of information there, and then also go on the Maryland State website, uh, the for the state house, and you can get lists of when there are committee hearings and when there are, uh, or even open hearings or meetings pertaining to cannabis. Uh, and well, folks can do this in from whatever state they're in. All of these um, um, sites that Andrew mentioned have their counterparts in other states, and so you know, don't do a forget little, normal. Normal is a big one. Yeah, well, there's a Maryland Absolutely. chapter, of Maryland Normal. Uh, yeah, that, that's exactly. a big one. But also, as, as far as Maryland's concerned, because you asked about Maryland, um, mm-hmm. uh, now there were there in the 2019 uh, session, they wanted to get a a item on the ballot so the Maryland voters can vote whether or not they wanted to legalize adult use. Now, so far, they haven't taken that off the the voting docket, but they haven't passed it yet. 
Mm-hmm. But regardless, okay, so it's still an open question, right? But regardless, yeah, Maryland. See. To answer your question, is really Maryland is sort of on track. It should see recreational adult use happening probably in twenty twenty two. So uh, that's when you might be seeing uh, rec- uh, adult use uh, dispensaries open in the state. Mm-hmm. Now, Maryland, like like some states, are taking a, a, a kind of a slow boat approach to this. Um, and so far, I think they've done a very what they did with uh, medical. They went slow with it, took their time, and for the most part, I think got it right. So you mm-hmm. can find all of this stuff. Check out the take action um, page at votepropot.com. And you can send us an email at podcast at votepropot.com. Or as Claire did, you can call our message line at 240-257-2441. And we will put you on the show. And please like, follow, share, and comment on our social networking pages. Just do a search for Vote Pro Pot on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I think it's a little bit of a funny turnaround, an ironic turnaround, that um, all of these years after, you know, people have been smuggling weed in from Mexico, seems to be going the other way uh, to some degree. <laughs> right, Andrew? Yeah, there's... Um, we've, been, we've talked about this before in the podcast last year, uh, and there were articles saying how they're starting to see that happen. But now, since recreational has opened up in, in California, they're starting to see a big big flow. They're, they're actually noticing it. That some dispensaries in San Diego, they're saying, yeah, we're seeing dozens of people from Mexico hmm. cross the border, come in here, buy, and then go back home. Uh, no kidding. You know, every day, I, I think, uh, you know, I think it's over a million people cross the border from Mexico into the United States hmm. and then go back, you know, whether no for work or <laughs> recreation, you know. Um, so, and they really don't, what it turns out, when you're, uh, Coming into the United States, man, you got to go through, you got to get a colonoscopy, you know. But (laughs) when you're going from the United States into Mexico, they just sort of wave at you. And if they do pull you over, they do pull you over, they're just looking for flour. They're not even looking for oils and edibles. They're not even looking for it. Yeah. So what's the advantage for for the Mexicans to buy it in the U.S. and take it back? I mean, can they really make better weed? Oh, much higher. Well, you know what you're getting? You're getting legal. So it's going to be a safe product. You're going to get a great selection so you get exactly what you want. You know? Yeah, I just would think it, there wouldn't be a lot of profit in it, but I guess. Well, you I know, I think that, that a lot of people now, when they get when they try legal cannabis for the first time, or for the first time as opposed to black market cannabis, they notice a big change in quality. They also notice that the, some mm-hmm. of the that moldy, musky smell is never there anymore. Uh, right, it's true. also that's cured true. perfectly. You know, like now I know Verano brand. Right. You know, you buy their stuff in Maryland, and it's in a glass jar with a hydro pack in it. It's cured perfectly. Right. It smell all the terpenes are still in there, man. You know, as mm-hmm. opposed to some Ziploc. Nice. Yeah, come on. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I used to be just happy as Clay's just to get the Ziploc, and right, now it's yeah. old new ball. Right I mean, now, you're, now you're picky, but uh, <laughs> but you know, I don't know. Maybe we're going to start seeing now in Mexico. They're talking about legalizing recreational or adult use cannabis. Now the uh, hmm. the yeah. former or the current mayor of Mexico City and the former president. Uh, have both called for the legalization, and the former president says that if you do legalize cannabis in, in Mexico, we're going to take the majority of the profits away from the drug cartels. And what better way to put them out of business than, yeah. you know, Hello? you just can't shut them down. you got to take away the business, you know. That's right. Follow the money. So, and, and also, God, I can imagine, so they really don't check for what's going, imagine what else is going from the United States into Mexico if they're not really <laughs> checking. I think, well, well, I read an interesting article once that said, all the, the the drug wars that are fought uh, in Mexico and Central America are all fought with American-made guns smuggled out of the United States. Mm. Or not all of them, but a great percentage of them. A lot, yeah. You know, so. We never talk Doesn't about... Yeah, me. I don't hear anyone, any American politicians talking about that. Staying with California, uh, one of the big problems um, with legal cannabis industry is really what do you do with the money the it's you know how to handle the money and the problem has been that because many big banks do business across straight uh, across state lines um they have to have their eye on federal enforcement and so it's very difficult 
for cannabis industry um, folks to use the banking system that every other industry is able to use, that the other legal industries are able to use. Um, so they've been kind of shut out of traditional banking um, by federal laws. Now, this article from NBCBayArea.com um, shines a little light on this, um, and it's an article about um, legislation coming out of the California Senate. Um, they, they voted 35 to 1 on Tuesday to pass a bill that would allow people to start banks or credit unions that could accept cash deposits from marijuana retailers. Uh, and that's a big development, and, and hopefully that will ease a lot of people's banking discomfort. These banks could uh, issue special checks to the retailers that could only be used for certain purposes, paying taxes, uh, paying California vendors, that sort of thing. Um, so it would be limited in scope, but um, it would make it easier for licensed cannabis retail retailers to handle what are vast amounts of money. And in most cases, uh, cash, <laughs> right? In most cases, cash, well, and, yes. And in all cases. In yeah. all cases, exactly, Andrew, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you, we've done articles about uh, the, some of these dispensaries and companies that literally have these incredibly expensive and elaborate security squads just to deal with carrying their cash back and forth and storing it in vaults and stuff because they can't put it in the bank. It's crazy. And they, and they, have, to go, right. they have to go down to City Hall to pay their taxes in cash, which means in they have cash. to take security. <laughs> and I heard there were sometimes they had to use a hand truck. Wow. Jeez. Right, and and probably a contingent of big guys. I'm sure. You know, yeah. you, you would know. think. Well, the problem is, you know, like I said, federal laws prohibit banks from handling um, any cash or funds that come from criminal activities. And since, according to the federal government, cannabis retail is a criminal activity, um, they they can't, you know, they mm -hmm. can't accept that money. Um, so this is a this is a helpful uh, step and, for California retailers, and you know we'll see how that works and if that spreads to uh, to other states. Actually, I saw something at the dispensary that I go to here in Maryland on 420. I went in and they just had renovated, and G Leaf had taken over management of the local dispensary. I was talking to one of the corporate guys from G Leaf. And we were just talking about the industry, and I said, you know, have, can you guys get, get gift cards? Why don't you get gift cards? I mean, can, that, can you do that? And he goes, wow, that sounds like a good idea. Well, I went in there last week, and damn if they didn't have G-Leaf gift cards now. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't even give you a finder's fee. And, oh, and apparently, nice. you could, I think you can buy it with a credit card. Ah, yeah, I don't okay, know. Okay, because it's a gift card, maybe? I don't yeah, know. I don't that's, know if you get it, and then you got, I think you might have to go online to put the money on the card. Gotcha. You know, which makes hey, which would make sense because then that's you know. a great workaround if that's legal. That's a great workaround for them to deal with cash. Just keep loading up your card. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And how many people are going to lose their marijuana gift card? Huh? Yeah, I put right. it somewhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> Where in the fuck did I? It's with my stash. Oh Shit. man, did you lose it, man? couple of names in the news, some ex-Democratic lawmakers. Yeah, former Senator Majority Leader Tom Daschle, Democrat from South Dakota, and former Representative Joseph Crowley of uh, New York, Democrat, joined the advisory board of cannabis investment firm Northern Swan Holdings this week, making the latest entrance by high-profile politicians into the burgeoning industry. Now, we talked in, in last week or the week before, we talked in, in our episode about um, Boehner and um, how all of a sudden some of these huge transactions are happening in the United States between large companies buying other large companies and making huge investments. It, it, it spurred the opinion by some writers that something's getting ready to happen. So coincidentally, these these uh, politicians always seem to find the money. <laughs> Let's face it. And these guys are no longer in office. So what do they do when they get out of office, Phil? They become lobbyists and and, yeah. advi and get to sit on advisory boards for panels that are going to make a lot of money, so they can yeah, cash. That's where in they on make it. the real money. That's where they make the real money. Exactly. Crowley was lost his bid to uh, in the primary last year, in the Democratic primary in his state, to 
uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. So he's out of work, and Dashiell's out of work. He lost as well a couple years back, right, Phil? Well, several years back. Yeah, it's been a while uh, Joe now. Crowley was one of the top guys in the yeah. Democratic Party in the House, and losing that uh, that election, that, that primary, came out of nowhere, and uh, you know AOC just outworked him. Period. <laughs> just, you know, yeah. Just whipped him, <laughs> and and just the force of her personality. Say what you like about the woman, but you know she got it she, done. Uh, she, yeah, she blew a lot of people away and and got it done. This company is Northern Swan, a New York based investment firm, and they have stakes in several international cannabis brands, including a huge Colombia based medical cannabis company. So um, they just recently closed a fifty eight million dollar. Series D Ooh. financing deal. And um, so far to date, they've raised a hundred million bucks. So these guys are ah. poised and in position to make some serious scratch in the U.S. when things become legal and uh, leave it to a couple scummy politicians to jump on the bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> Now, no one said they were scummy. I mean, unless you consider all politicians to be scummy. Oh, and you I consider have a point. all. Sorry. <laughs> all right. You probably have a point there. You know, I, I'm noticing something in the industry, and that is uh, you can quit. People are starting to tell the difference between the people that are in the cannabis industry because they believe in cannabis, especially the medical, and have always fought for its legalization. And then the people who never lifted a finger for, for legalization and are just in it for the money. And I think some of those people are starting, I think the people in the industry are starting to gravitate towards the corporations that, that, that uh, embrace cannabis it's culture, quite, you know, or the other ones, they're well, just in for the money. Well, you know, because I, you know, I talked to some people, they go, I went into a dispensary and there's a guy who I recognize as a, as a local police officer with a gun eyeing me up and down as I walk in. And not smiling, saying, hi, welcome to our, to our dispensary. And I walk in, mm-hmm. and my first impression is, oh, shit, am I going to get shot? You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so why is it you recognize this cop so readily? Well, no, I'm just saying, I was talking to someone who's, who told me that story. <laughs> oh, well, you, you, just, oh. you, you, you live in a town, no matter what. I mean, I'm sure you, you, <laughs> see, you get to know some local cops, and you walk into a dispensary, <laughs> and there's an, you know, one of the, a cop who was out to arrest me, throw me in jail, possibly the hospital. Right. You know? He even bought me the morgue, for that matter, over weed. <laughs> and now he wants to take my money. You know, I'm like, hey, you know, if I have my choice between him and the guy who, you know, used to be the, the drummer in some band you know, or, or, a yeah. local, or a local chef who opened up a dispensary or something like that, you know, who was, or, or yeah. you know, or a bar guy, maybe. You know? uh, yeah, they go, okay, I know this guy. You know, they're going to support those people. That's what I see. And also, I, I think personally, I'm looking to get in the industry, and I'm looking for a company that's embracing the cannabis culture and and have always stood for the legalization, as opposed to those companies that are just, you know, ex-sheriffs and, or excuse me, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, the people who are just getting into it for, just for the money. See, I, I'm, I'm the opposite. I want to do business with the people who are just in it for the money. <laughs> You know, this this country was built on people who are just in it for the money. I mean, you you, you think uh, Andrew Carnegie loved the smell of, of steel mills? No. You know what <laughs> Andrew Carnegie money. said? He goes, if you die with more than $10 in your bank account, you're a failure. Because if you don't, well, no, I give, agree money, with that. If you don't give money and help other people and do philanthropic things and build schools and hospitals and libraries, then you're a failure. That's yeah. true. But while, but while he's there making the money, you know, I, I want the people who know how to make money. Making money, um, and so you uh, only want to get happen- to, to successful people. Well, I, I would only want to partner with successful people um, who I buy from. I just want to buy from the people who give me the best value for my dollar. So that um, doesn't yeah, not necessarily just, be the but, best or the most successful. They're just the cheapest. Right. So, yes, but I mean, just because he's a you know a, a drummer in a band doesn't mean he doesn't know how to launch a cannabis ba- brand. Right. You know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know. Uh, um, you know. Doesn't he doesn't have to be a Grateful Dead drummer or anything? Well, actually, I don't to... think you're, you're, it, it, you're. You can come from any background and run a successful or failed dispensary. And my my point is, is that people are they just don't understand from some industries that now because although they call it medical and they they call them patients, you have to think of them and treat them like customers because they can go anywhere else. And now right. there's some people that are opening up uh, dispensaries because they know people are just looking for the cheapest deal. 
you know, they're right. not necessarily if, looking but if for. But if those people are providing a better product and service because they believe in it, that great for me, you know, love it. Right. But, uh, you know, the day the day the Grateful Dr- Dead drummer becomes a cannabis entrepreneur, let me know. Grateful Dead drummer Mickey Hart announces the launch of a cannabis brand. So we have yet another famous celebrity jumping into the cannabis biz. Grateful Dead drummer Mickey Hart has officially joined the Green Rush by announcing his new line of one third gram mini joints. Hear that, Andrew? Weren't you just talking about that last week? Yep. Somebody needs yep. to start a company selling pin joints. Stuff with a strain whose history is inextricably entwined with the famed traveling jam band. And it goes on to tell this story about a guy who, uh, his, his some deadhead named Chem Dog, who followed them around for years. And he ha- had a strain of weed that became very popular amongst the deadheads following him on the road. And uh, so I guess uh, Mickey Hart's teamed up with this guy and they're going to sell kind of like little mini one third gram pin joints. Little bandits. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, exactly. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, start. It's, it's out in Northern California. So they'll be starting at dispensaries out there soon to be distributed sometime this year. So do you think any of his Twitter followers might be potential customers? Yeah, maybe. Could be. <laughs> maybe. Could be. <laughs> maybe one or two. And any of the people have seen him play in concert? So actually, I think this is a good example of, of for starters, I, you know, Jay, your children, do they know who the hell Mickey Hart is? Oh, yeah. Well, maybe not by name, but they certainly know the Grateful Dead. They know the Grateful Dead. But I think, I think the fact that someone like I that is coming out, they're targeting the boomers, man. This is, you know. Yeah, cause, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, again, once again. Because yeah. I'm more and more thinking, I go into the dispensaries and I see people trying to make a decision and, and I'm going, they're going, man, just give me a, you know, something that, that'll put me to sleep, something that doesn't put me to sleep and it tastes good. You know, how much is it? You know, they really don't care. And they're starting to look at, oh, Willie's got that? I'll, give, I'll take Willie's brand. You know, and now there's, oh, Grateful Dead brand? I'll take that. Yeah. Oh, it's marketing 101, right, Phil? I think, yeah. You know? I mean, you're the marketing guy. Nothing succeeds like success. I mean, it's it's uh, it's endorsement marketing, and that's a great thing. Why so many of these celebrities are, are getting into it? Because, you know, the name recognition alone, you know, it's a big deal. Yeah, well, he's, his company, the brand's going to be called Mind Your Head. And he's teamed up with an Oakland-based cannabis company, IC Collective. So, good luck. So, it's a branding deal. He's not growing plants. That's right. It's a branding deal, is my understanding. There you go. Well, look, Martha Stewart, we talk about. Well, I read today that she made an announcement last week about a product, and uh, the stock jumped like 6% just from her making an announcement. So, the celebrity endorsement stuff works, obviously. Yeah, well, I think they're using a lot of these celebrities to go after the boomers, to go after the older, because they think a lot of... Uh, a lot of people are realizing that that's that's a good that's a that's a growing percentage of the market. They're spending a lot of money, and they have it is income. interesting that a lot of these celebrity endorsers are um, boomers, you know, or or right. the older, oh, slightly older generation. Now, that's not to say it's that's it because there's a lot of there's a couple of now, rappers. Are there, and, are there any millennials or Gen Xers who are who are doing that? A couple of rappers I mean, I've read about. That is is never Taylor Swift coming out with a line? I was going <laughs> to ask about Taylor Swift. I'd buy it. <laughs> the, the Taylor Spleef. A lot of people in the cannabis industry have long been saying, why is cannabis illegal when beer and wine and liquor are illegal? So now that we're seeing more and more uh, states legalizing cannabis and the whole country of Canada, we're starting to see the effect of cannabis sales versus beer sales. Now, in Canada, they've actually seen a decline in, in uh, beer sales. And actually, they've been actually noticing it for the last couple of years, which actually started before cannabis was legalized. But since it was legalized, they actually have seen a 6.8% uh, decrease in sales from the year before. Now, some people say that that has to do with, with cannabis, but some people say there's other effect, there's other influences why uh, people aren't drinking. And the same, you're seeing the same in the United States. And I think what it is is a lot of the younger people are just aren't drinking as often or as much as the, their preceding generations. You know, I think a lot of them go into bars and they see some old guy with gray hair sticking out from underneath his turtleneck and he's crouched over a bar screaming about socialism into his beer. <laughs> 
You know, they're going, I don't want to be that guy, man. Well, I guess that's a good thing. I mean, not, not well, that, but I mean, that if, if the if the millennials and Gen Xers and such are, are you know, consuming less alcohol, I, I imagine that's a, a good public health thing. Well, they're, they're starting to make healthier options, you know. So when they are, are drinking alcohol, they're probably not drinking, you know, tons of margaritas and pina coladas as much as just, I don't know, vodka and sodas and wine, I guess, whatever. But but one of the things that happened in in Colorado last year was that uh, not only did they make a record uh, sales in cannabis, but they also had record beer sales. In the last four years in Colorado, since <laughs> cannabis has been, has been legalized, beer sales have gone up steadily. As a matter of fact, the last 2017 was the largest beer sales ever in the state. In you know, Whoa. since I guess since uh, they've been recording beer since prohibition. So, wow. So they don't know. So is it you know cannabis taken away from beer sales or is it? Uh, I think it is, I think when it really comes down to it, there's been some studies and now they're saying that yeah it does have an effect. Now I think what you're seeing it especially for the people that are looking for the most buzz for the buck, you know, the guys that are buying the box wines and the twelve packs and the and or yeah. the thirty packs or whatever you know. Uh, those people are going to, they're going to be the ones that go, well, I'm going to, I could, for the same amount of money, I could, you know, buy mm-hmm. weed. You know? Well, I think the drinking culture has probably changed some too. That's I mean, true. people seem to be a lot more health conscious nowadays than they were in our day. Well, I hope so. I mean, my kids don't drink like, I mean, we used to walk around with a bottle of Jack Daniels and you know what I mean? Well, well, surprisingly, more and more of these beverage companies are seeing some the, the uh, cannabis may be affecting their sales or not. But it's not surprising that a lot of these cannabis, a lot of these beverage companies are starting to get into the beverage industry. Constellation Brands just invested four mm-hmm. billion dollars in canopy, canopy growth. Um, Damn. <laughs> uh, AB uh, in beverage, the owners of Budweiser brand, and they own Labatt's in Canada. They just teamed up with Tilray. Another mm-hmm. cannabis producer has developed a non-alcoholic beverage infused with THC and CBD. Uh, Guinness is getting into the game. There's been talks about. Uh, because actually the company that owns Molson and, and Coors is getting into a joint venture with the Hexo Group to develop a cannabis based drink in the, for, the, for the Canadian market. There's a, a craft uh, brewery in Canada that's owned by Heineken that's launching a Lagunitas craft beer. They're, off, they're starting a hi fi hops flavored sparkling water. So it's going to be more of a soda, I, I guess. Um, which is okay. And, and they're talking Pepsi and Starbucks and other companies, Coca-Cola, they're all talking about getting into it. Mm-hmm. So what you're seeing is, is these companies now, in the United States, you can't infuse cannabis into any alcoholic beverages, but you're seeing it in other countries. Uh, and specifically in Europe, you're seeing some liquors infused with cannabis. Oh, really? So, yeah. So maybe, the, um, so, so maybe you might see that more in the United States, but I seriously doubt it. But it's smart that these companies are, you know, getting involved with the cannabis industry. Um they don't want to get left aced out of business. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. these kind of things take on a life of their own. They don't want to get, you know, blindsided by it. Well, you just got to move with the times. I think there are some uh, horse and buggy carriage companies that eventually started throwing <laughs> engines in them you know, yeah. and turned into car yeah. companies, you know, I'm sure. That's right. So not only are all these beverage companies get, getting involved in infusing products uh, with cannabis, but there's a lot of other companies that are coming up with, you know, the... Uh, with CBD uh, lotions and creams and, and God knows what else, you know. Uh, and it's sort of like, like bacon. It was like bacon-flavored whiskey, bacon-flavored, you know, you know ice oh, cream God, and yes. popcorn. Mm-hmm. They, ice cream. They even had a bacon-flavored condom. <laughs> <laughs> How did it taste? So, I don't know if it's vegetarian, though. <laughs> but I do have one thing to say, though, though. If you plan on using bacon-flavored condoms, trust me, tie up your dog first. <laughs> Well, especially if his favorite uh, treat are sausages. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a move that uh, uh, that uh, comes right out of the about damn time file, <laughs> um, it seems the NFL is taking a first kind of baby step towards maybe changing its. Uh, rules with regard to uh, players and marijuana. The NFL Players Association, that's kind of the, the, the players' union, um, has created a committee to establish standards for team practices and policies regarding pain management and the use of prescription medication by NFL players, as well as conduct research 
concerning patient management and what they call alternative therapies. And among those alternative therapies is cannabis. According to uh, the NFL chief medical officer, Alan Sills, he says, quote, we're asking our pain management committee to bring us any and all suggestions. We'll look at marijuana. He says, I think it's a proud day for the NFL and the NFL Players Association to come together on these issues in a public way. I think it demonstrates the spirit of cooperation we have around our health, safety, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So um, they are kind of, uh, I mean, you can just list on both hands and both feet the players who have been suspended for testing positive for cannabis in just the last couple of years. And, you know, my reaction has always been, really, you know, would you rather have them taking opioids for pain? Because that's kind of the alternative when these people get banged up. So I I think this is a great step, and hopefully it leads to some more sensible um, NFL rules. Well, this all comes out of negotiations between the players' unions and the owners. And the the players' union has very strongly advocated removing cannabis from the list of um, illegal substances for quite some time. And we did a story just a couple of weeks ago, right, guys, about the sports yep. and the, the difference between the leagues. And uh, the, I'd say the NFL is the toughest with regard to how they treat players who've uh, tested positive for cannabis. But also, they're the players probably with the most injuries and who have to deal most with pain of all the leagues, wouldn't you say? Well, one of them, between them and hockey. Between them and hockey. But, I mean, football is a very violent sport. And these guys are always in pain Monday through Thursday or Friday, you know. And, I mean, it just, their arguments have been, obviously, what do you want us to be doing? Taking opioids on a regular basis? Or do you want us to smoke a little weed in the evening and relieve our pain? So, you know, the problem is that the the... It's been it's been a real um, bucking of heads between the two, the owners and the players union. So maybe this is a step towards resolving that. Let's hope. You know, let's hope. It seems to me, though, it's a no brainer. Any fairly literate person knows that cannabis is going to be a better option than opioids. And you want to keep the opioid use to a minimum if you want these guys to perform, you know. Exactly. Uh, you yeah. So I, I wonder, what is the real? Is it, is it is it just still the political or the stigma? Yeah, that's a good question. It would, mu- it would and, have to be. I can't think of what else it is. You know. Well, in in the articles I read today that you're covering here, Phil, some of them they still mention that the, the question was asked of the commissioner: What about your stance at the Super Bowl on commercials for legal CBD products? And he said, No, that hasn't changed. So in the Not- upcoming season, there still won't be any money accepted from advertisers. For any kind of cannabis products of any kind. But Viagra's okay. <laughs> right. Well, um, going from football to a somewhat less contact sport, <laughs> uh, golf. Indeed. Um, we've got some news out of Colorado. In Colorado, that's right. Uh, and we did a story on, on that story we just mentioned on, on weed and sports. And Andrew came up, we were coming up with a list of sports you almost need to get high to play. And one of them was golf. Colorado Golf <laughs> Blog has announced the state's first ever cannabis-friendly golf tournament series. Organizers will staff, yeah, man, organizers will staff the course with bud and dab tenders to serve a variety of cannabis products to event participants free of charge. The second annual CGB tournament series kicks off at King's Deer Golf Club in Monument, Colorado on Saturday, May 25th. So by the time the show airs, that'll probably have happened. But if you're interested, I'm sure you can go sign up for next year's. That's that's um, what do they call this? They call it it's the Colorado Golf Blog. And they talk to uh, Craig Lemley, who is the co-founder of CGB. CGB's kickoff event sold out within two days of the official announcement with more than 120 players registering. So this is a big thing, man, <laughs> playing golf. And can you imagine? You know how you play golf? I don't play golf, but you ride around in a car drinking beer. I've always said that's my kind of sport, even though I don't play. Right. But imagine, you know, 
coming up to the each hole or whatever you do, you get to the next tee off, and there's some little woman coming over in her little cart with a series of joints and products you can select from. Pretty cool. I'm in. That's pretty cool. Well, that that that. So I guess they were uh, bar carts when I played golf. Um, they would have these bartender, you know, these girls, yeah, uh, yeah, come around in bar carts and say, "Now I guess now they're going to be bud carts, bud carts, man, bud carts, right?" <laughs> but I tell you, I've been to a lot to a lot of uh, golf courses, and I know a lot of guys that play golf, and and uh, man, they've been smoking weed on golf oh, courses yeah. for a long time. But this is a perfect example of how on one side of the city they're having um, a a, uh, a hemp fest, or they're having a, a some kind of uh, cannabis expo. And you might one might be full of tie dye and and dreads, and at <laughs> this cannabis point. event, it's a bunch of guys walking around in plaid pants, you know, <laughs> knickers. <laughs> you know, I, we, I, when we we talk about the cannabis culture segregating, I think this is a prime example of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Four. Well, that's our episode for this week. Thank you all for taking the time to join us here on Vote Pro Podcast. We would love to hear from you. We would love for you to uh, check out um, our webpage and, and see for yourself some of the things that you can do to be involved, to stay informed, uh, and to be part of the solution. Absolutely check us out at votepropot.com. Send us an email at podcast at votepropot.com. Call our message line like Claire did at 240-257-2441. And please like and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Just do a search for Vote Pro Pot. Wish I was a pin Good old sense me yeah, at the beginning of the day. But here I am in New York City, hiding out the Central Park, getting kidnapped by the ponies. Today, sometime before dark. But I wish I was a Ben Van at the Canvas Cafe. Smoking good old sense me up at the beginning of the day. The judge looked down upon me, friend. He said, kid, get on your way. Just don't start out your morning with espresso and a J. I said, I wish I was a big man. Smoking good old sense media at the beginning of the day. Hitched on now to port. Took the bus over to the neighborhood To have a bowl with my coffee Now I'm up in Vancouver At the Cannabis Cafe Smoking good old sense media 